Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's my pleasure as the director of IMARC to welcome you to this um, lunchtime lecture series. Uh, the third lecture in the series on blue skies thinking for blue growth. Uh, the first couple of lectures we focused on issues around foreshore licensing with Dr. Anne Marie O'Hagan from Beaufort Research. Uh, more recently, we had um, Andrew Parrish from South and Sea Technology uh, talking about opportunities around um, marine renewables and ocean technology. And it's an absolute pleasure uh, today um, to introduce Armand Dixon from um, C5 Stroke Sea Tech. Um, Armand originally uh, founded and developed a company called Fix IT and in the last couple of years uh, made that transition to pursue his passion for both ICT and the Marine. And I think it's our uh, privilege and pleasure to see that there's been a convergence in, in terms of how Arno has taken some uh, concepts forward through um, his startup company. And uh, without a shadow of a doubt, he's been making significant progress in terms of technology development. He was awarded the first um, IMARC Innovator of the Year Award um, last October at our IMARC conference. I'm sure he'll be in the mix and a contender again for, for this year's award and we'll be actually um, announcing uh, the process for uh, receiving applications with respect to that in the next few weeks as well as announcing um, dates for the Denmark conference this October. Um, but with respect to today's proceedings, um, it's an absolute pleasure to announce a great friend and colleague, um, Arnaud Dissant, who uh, is going to speak about the challenge of uh, and the opportunity of Cork Carver becoming a, a global hub for uh, wireless communications. Arnold. Thank you, Pat. Come on, Thanks for coming up. All of you actually uh, was not expecting that many people being interested in marine IT actually. Uh, today, you're going to hear about marine ICT, and, I, and, I, and I'll stress that word several times, and I'll explain why later on. Uh, you'll hear about uh, the challenges of setting up a wireless harbor and uh, Wi-Fi technology into the maritime environment. And at the end, uh, I'll welcome some questions, uh, if you have any. I'll try to keep that presentation non-technical, so it can be followed by, by anyone. At some stage, uh, at some stage, I'll touch on, on security. Uh, this presentation was given almost a, a week ago to the uh, communication court uh, of the uh, defense uh, with all the uh, uh, pretty much technical uh, aspect that, that this may uh, cover uh, for defense. So, talking of challenge, well, Battery touched on the first challenge. The company started in 2007 as Fix IT. Uh, Basically, I, I first envisioned based on my background. I have a naval background, and when I was when I when I when I left uh, naval infantry, uh, I, I retrained as a CAD uh, designer. That training was paid by the defense. And I, I I worked in IT for pretty much 15 years uh, as a consultant. Uh, I was specializing into doing migration, email migrations. Uh, mostly for most of the major telco, uh, Dutch Post, France Telecom, BT. Uh, my first six years in Ireland, I think I've traveled three times around the world, uh, so I didn't spend much time really in, in, in Dublin. Uh, but along the line, I, I, I kind of uh, matured the idea of reconciling uh, together my, my naval background together with my IT background. Uh, and, and basically when I started Fix IT, I knew that I would deliver as much work as I could in, in the maritime world. Uh, we're in Ireland, so basically there are you know, a lot of maritime opportunities. It took two years, and within two years basically every time there was a, an interesting uh, IT project in the maritime world, uh, well, we received a phone call, and I, and I started receiving phone calls also from companies abroad, uh, Maxi, uh, who's a software development company, uh, asked if I would become their contact in, in, in Ireland. Maxi was developing, uh, before it was purchased by Fundo, uh, and, uh, a software yachting, uh, actually, 
interface, a bit of a crossover between passage planning with chart plotter. It's used, by the way, on uh, Chaotic Voyager, I think. Uh, so, more projects, and one day I met Val, who said, you know, maybe you could come to the Maritime College and uh, explain what is it you're doing. So, I started writing a marine IT course, and I see a few people who attended this course in, in the room. Hey, yeah. Uh, so, uh, the, the interesting thing about that, this is it, it coined really the, the, the terminology marine IT. Uh, as an IT engineer, I, I had huge exposure on hardware and software. And that, that, was, that was nice, great. I, I gained a lot of knowledge uh, about server or any kind of hardware, uh, networking and all this. But when I, when I became a marine IT, Engineer, I had to learn electrical and I had to learn RF, uh, which are two topics you, you probably <coughs> do not touch too much when, you, when you're working in IT on, on land. So the definition of marine IT today would be pretty much a person who can equally you know, understand uh, RF and networking, generally speaking, electrical, hardware, and software. When do you know you have? Network skills, i.e., TCP/IP. Well, maybe not when you have an MCAC or a CCNA, but when you start buying reels of Cat5 by 300 meters, because that's where you you you, you know you, you start networking a uh, lot of boards uh, and places and everything. So that's how uh, things have evolved for me. Uh, along the line, I started doing consulting uh, activities. Aside from uh, the product we, we, we specialize with, uh, you see here the Sukofish asset tracking. We'll talk about this also. Uh, weather stations, we have one on Spike. Uh, Cormac is not here today. Uh, Halpin Research Center actually has been uh, doing a lot of work around, around that. Uh, or IP cameras around uh, the harbor. Uh, and actually, the first man in this room actually got an interest and encouraged me on this. Actually, it's Commodore Tully sitting, sitting here uh, a few years back. Uh, he came to my office upstairs and we started looking into cameras in Rochester Point and the feed was sent wirelessly uh, across the port. That gave, the, that gave me the idea that networking a port wirelessly would give us a lot of uh, uh, latitude to, 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 to do a lot of projects. Uh, so C5 Horizon was born. Uh, basically, in my, my break. Uh, the main challenge, I think, is the people. When you when you do all this, and even when you speak to people like I am doing today, uh, you have to understand that people come from lots of different kind of backgrounds. People use iPhones, iPads, uh, any kind of smartphone handheld device. But they don't necessarily understand all the uh, functionalities behind. It's not because you can connect your iPhone, for example, to, to a wireless network uh, that you understand TCP IP and all the networking processes behind. And that's, that's a huge uh, difficulty for me because change management is probably more difficult than uh, technology. Uh, well, if you take wireless uh, technology, TCP IP protocols are there, wireless radio waves, okay, no need to invent them, that's here. But when you need to explain to a man on a, on, on a vessel, well, you were doing your job uh, in a such a way, well, now you're going to have to log all this on a computer because it facilitates, for example, the invoicing of a towage in, 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 in the port. Well, that's change management. And, and you need to make sure that this person understands very well how, how things work. You know, we, we all understand roughly how a car works, we drive a car, and no one would get on the road without understanding the fact that there is no clutch and there is basically brakes. But we use technology without all that understanding. So, one misconception uh, is the fact that, for example, people can uh, could use their phone and connect, you know, at miles of a distance. To, to any uh, any any access point, for example, but your phone used usually three different kind of uh, technology. It used 
the GPRS technology, which works around the 900 uh, megahertz, it used Bluetooth, it used Wi-Fi. That's three different ways of connecting your iPhone. And it's through that example that I want to explain the fact that people have a misconception around uh, uh, technology because their phone can connect in the distance and they can make phone call. Well, they assume that the male, the male using 3G, for example, or even wireless can do the same. Your, your phone will give you 60 meters of range on, on a, on a Wi-Fi, uh, basically, uh, network, and will give you much, much more uh, on the phone system. So it is uh, the, the, the man, the, the people, uh, is really what I had to work uh, on. On that slide, you see various applications uh, where, where I've been using my skills basically. So you see the data, uh, and the illustration is the data boy that we have outside uh, Port of Cork, the smart bay boy, which is connected through a C5 link to Rochester Point Lighthouse. And the same link that a few years ago uh, connected uh, a camera, uh, well, helps us bring back that data all the way to Galway. By the way, uh, there's a man called Pat, they're just in the corner. He's the guy who had the, the first idea for a camera actually in Russia's point during the, 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 the course, the, the Marine IT course a couple of years ago. Uh, so I just kind of uh, made this, but, but the idea was not mine. Uh, a lot of uh, application. Uh, Steve Slate from Skytech uh, and I were working quite closely with uh, UAVs and how we can send back uh, the data from a UAV. Either back to the ground, that's easy, or directly online, directly basically available to the internet, like in the case, for example, of a maritime uh, threat um, pollution, for example. Uh, crew have been using on uh, Jerry O'Sullivan, uh, C5 wireless, and I spent how in a few slides actually. Uh, security, the cameras, tracking. Uh, I'll, I'll, have a few, uh, I'll say a few words about tracking because we've run a very interesting experience uh, over the weekend and, and weather station. All these have in common the fact that they use TCP IP networking. What you know as a network cable, well, all this can, can convey a lot of information when it comes to the maritime uh, environment. So a lot of opportunities. I have a small uh, video which I'm going to show you. Uh, we won't go through all of it, but that will give you uh, an introduction to C5, what has been done and why we've done C5.
tons of waves. Basically, uh, there is a deficit in communication uh, in the maritime environment. If you don't want to use uh, satellite communication, because it's technically not possible, think, for example, for a minute of uh, a buoy, a buoy at sea, uh, where using a satellite uh, phone on board just to transmit data would be a bit of an overkill. Uh, there is a misconception as well around 3G and 4G. People think that it's available at sea where operators uh, generally are thinking of much larger uh, urban concentration, so it's worth their assets. Uh, so if you, if you exclude those two uh, ways and the fact that VHF cannot carry much data, uh, well, you, there, there is a, there is a, a gap. Uh, and um, when we were doing the first test with the cameras, the idea quickly came up that a port could become a gigantic land and instead of having cameras around the port and weather stations and all kind of uh, TCP IP oriented uh, device, you have some on the table there, and, and sending all that data on the internet where well, maybe you could make all this, you know, a wireless land and then port operation could access tap into all this resource without worrying about bandwidth. And the antenna you see there next to me is an S360. You have one on Jerry Sullivan, one on Dennis Murphy, one on the boy out there, one on a committee boat today. They, they all carry a throughput of 150 megabytes of data per second. So it's a lot of data. And I remember sitting uh, at a meeting uh, with a company who takes care of uh, large data for a historical database and they were saying that in the Gulf of Mexico they have to send a helicopter to recover data from an oil rig. I started thinking to myself that using a helicopter that might be a little bit of a kill there and a, a, a you know, lot of money. The difficulty to all this is pioneering. Uh, when, you, when you start doing this you, you don't have any reference points. So not only you are going to develop something which is new, which seems to be first to market. And we've done research, actually, there is a man here, John Wilson, who worked with me for six months and did a lot of research around that. Uh, and uh, la last year, Port of Cork uh, published into an international press release the fact that they were the first wireless port. They didn't say in the world, but they said, the, you know, it kind of led to confusion. However, I've received phone calls from a lot of journalists around the world and so far no one has contested this. It would be a very nice thing to be challenged for though. Uh, I'd love to hear that Hong Kong, for example, has a gigantic, gigantic land and wireless and they can transfer data. But no, no, nothing like that. A lot of port are using 3G alright, but 3G is not available in, into all the boats. So it would be available most of the time along the keys. But if you take the, the, the Cork Harbour, for example, if you go to the oil terminal, okay, everybody kind of know where the oil terminal is, there is no 3D on there. I spent hours on tugs uh, around there, and I can tell you there is no 3D. Um, 
you have cases where 3G is available, of course, close to a urban concentration, as I said earlier. So pioneering is a bit of a difficult one. Then we went looking into why would people use CPI? Well, because for port authorities, but naval service, commercial shipping, offshore, uh, fishing fleet, uh, well, th there is that communication deficit. For example, fishermen have to, to log their daily cash, but the only thing available to them is a 3G dongle to log all this. So when they come into port, they have to offload data. And unfortunately, unless they use satellite, well, there is no connectivity, so they can't really uh, you know, do what they're asked to do. Um, well, when you develop a product like this, you have to ask yourself, will, will anyone buy this? I mean, a lot of, I keep saying that symmetries are full of uh, inventors and early adopters. Uh, the inventors will have their property, you know, their, 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 their invention, and the, the other side of the symmetry think we should have adopted this earlier. Uh, and actually, there must be long conversation uh, there. But the thing is, uh, in our case, we're a bit more lucky uh, than anyone else. Uh, when I was brought as the first entrepreneur of the AMR program here in the Maritime College, well, the Navy really committed to help. And, uh, when you, when you say, well, look, we've developed that product and we've tested this, you know, uh, with the Irish Naval Service, but it carries a certain element as well of uh, uh, respectability. Uh, the, the, we, we, we have two products on the shelf with CFI, CFI Horizon and Seabird. CFI Horizon is that idea of a, a gigantic land on the port. Uh, so basically, we set up uh, um, some um, coastal station, we call them, and then we can use a uh, ship station like this one. Uh, when the ship station rule between the coastal station, well, it remains connected. Uh, you can access local assets on the land, and you can access the internet, which is just another feature of your network, like a scanner or a printer. That's how it works. And then we have another product we call Seabird, and you can see some photos there. I have another return to well. But another idea, uh, that idea came from the Irish Naval Service. Monitoring fall off shots actually, uh, basically during gunnery exercise without using a helicopter. Well, could you do uh, 10 kilometers, 12 kilometers connectivity at sea? So back in December, I started, well, back in August last year, I started putting my head into this and building some antennas. And one antenna went on leave, and, and then during the winter, We've been using a rib and we managed to connect that camera to the rib. So basically, on the rib, we were able to watch that camera inside Neve. And the opposite would have been possible. We have located the camera on the rib, which opened more uh, actually uh, interesting possibilities. But if you, if you consider it this way, it means that if you have a boy with uh, cameras like this and targets set up, nearby where you don't need to fly a helicopter to monitor follow-up shots when you are uh, you know uh, firing gun shells and um, so that saves a lot of money <coughs> the whole idea behind c5 is to save money another example of saving money is for port of cork the staff of dennis murphy uh, the, the guys are servicing the port they're they're doing anything from recovering a, a wreck to uh, cleaning up boy, maintaining boys, maintaining pontoons. They, they're over the port. Uh, Master Alan Bone and, and his crew uh, used to, to, to pretty much steam back Tivoli every night to fill their time sheet. Now they can do that on the job. That saves an average of 200, 300 liters of fuel every day, uh, plus the time, the crew, the assets. It's, it's a lot of saving at the end of the year. Um, the technology now. Well, as I said a minute ago, uh, we use a uh, shore station, and actually there is a man there, John Burke, uh, from the CIA, who drove from Dublin actually to attend this presentation. John was among the first person I contacted to, to, to say, well, would you mind if I was to use Rochester Point Lighthouse to, to, to run some tests? For the past three years, I've been using Rochester Point as a, as a base, a research base, 
Uh, that's from Roger's point that we we done some tests with the Irish Naval Service aboard Eliola. We'll, we'll see that in a minute. My idea at the time was lighthouses are becoming obsolete. They used to be in light and it was useful. Uh, unfortunately, now it's it's becoming less and less useful. But I think they're they're great assets. There is one thing in the lighthouse: there is always power, and you can't tell that from any place around the port. They used to beam light, and I'd like to see them beaming data. And they could beam data for the next pretty much 100 years, because there is more and more data coming from the sea and going at sea than it ever had been before. On this slide, you pretty much see the principles of a CFI horizon. Basically, you set up around the port some coastal stations, which are access points, big access points. And in the center, you have a ship equipped with an omnidirectional antenna, an S360. And uh, basically, your, your boat will roam from one access point to, to another, based on which signal is the strongest. The roaming is the most difficult part. This S360 antenna is entirely built around. Uh, Roddy was sitting in there, is doing all the composite work. Uh, Brendan is our welder and does pretty much all the uh, skeleton behind. The electronic is all assembled into the wet lab in here. Uh, we build them as we go. Uh, we've, we've built enough for Port of Cork, and we're looking at other ports now to, to develop more uh, of these assets and, and, and link. They, they're unique, they're tagged, they're secure. I'd like to show you a radio. This is the radio that goes into that uh, um, antenna. They're pretty robust. Uh, Smart Bad Boy. Uh, at last Christmas, actually, during the big game, went vi virtually underwater. I, I went there on the 22nd of uh, December. I jumped on the pilot boat. Uh, Steve Palmer, the pilot, that went. Thought that was completely crazy. Uh, my wife too, by the way. But uh, they were 5.5 meters uh, swells, and, and the following day they would be 7.5. At 5.5, I had difficulty spotting the, bo the boy, basically. It was disappearing. Uh, regularly. Uh, and then at 7.5, most of the electronic on board went damaged, shattered completely. So they had to take in uh, the buoy. The, the antenna was still transponding all that time. So basically the only, only thing that survived the gale was the, the antenna itself. The same hardware is now in this antenna, still working with cover Gemini. They all have names. Uh, not that we are, you know, all soft and hard, but uh, we like the idea of having equipment that we trace. The radio in there is completely enclosed into resin, uh, so there is no radio interference. We had to build this here in the college, we had to imagine this in the college. Uh, the equipment which goes in, into there uh, basically is tightly monitored by us every day, uh, it's important. When the boy came in, uh, I opened the, the antenna and I found seaweed inside the red dome, proving that not only the boy went underwater, but there was water who went into that radio and still it was operating. That radio still works. I'm keeping it on my shelf as a souvenir. And there were also some big scratch on the red dome, huge scratch actually. And I thought, God, oh, what happened there? And actually, it was probably debris from floating debris that passed over and basically damaged uh, the radio. But the radio was so solid, basically, that nothing happened, just scratch on the paint. And it's back now, still working. And so basically, you build a, a network and then you can, you know, transfer data. So you can, first you build a C5 Horizon network, and then you can you know, move around video or a, a conversation with Manus McAllister here at the VPN, uh, have all your data secure, uh, transfer emails. And you can set up also access point. Dockside is an access point. We have one in Cove and one in Regas TV. And I don't know if Colin Jenkins is here today. Um, Colin is the uh, local chaplain and he goes on board all the liners and all the boats that are coming in. The photo at the bottom, it's his photo. All, what you see there are people who are using C5 on board Artania. 
Uh, these guys, when they, 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 they're on sometimes six weeks on, sometimes several months, three months on, and then they go off, they go and see their family. So for them, C5 is a way as well to, to contact the family. When you are uh, working on a, on a ship and you arrive in a foreign country, well, using your 3G will cost you a fortune. Calling the family is not that easy. So knowing that on the key, you have an access point is very handy. Uh, not so long ago, we had a, a US Navy uh, ship coming into Cove. Within an hour from them being alongside, 30 to 40 sailors were online. And they were calling their family and doing Skype and telling everything is fine. I'll be home soon. So it's an, another important element as well, the crew welfare. Tracing of assets. We can locate our antennas within two meters, approximately. And it's used, we, we use a very precise um, um, VMS tracking device, which is embedded into the, uh, the, the antenna. Uh, think of marine traffic if it was private, completely. And if basically you would tell far more information than what marine traffic is giving you. So position of vessels as well as that as battery state or uh, geofencing, for example, which is very interesting. With our assets, we can create a fence around the asset, and when the asset is moving, so when the antenna is moving, breaking that fence, well, we know. But as well, when the fence is coming into the port, so passing Rochester Point Lighthouse, well, we know. And basically, text messages or email can be sent to the relevant people. It would be very handy to know that uh, a ship is passing by uh, a certain place uh, at a certain time. I'll talk more about that because over the weekend, uh, two persons went rowing. You know, it was a big rowing event uh, during the weekend. And they carried that tracer. And all battery powered. Every minute we were able to tell where they were. If they would have retired or if they would have had any problem, we could rescue them within minutes because we knew exactly where they were. More on this in a, in a moment. Tracking started with basically Dennis Murphy again. So that Damon multicast, which you see there on the photo, is a very nice research lab for me. Lots of muscle power, uh, plenty of technology. It's as ugly as it is efficient. And we started putting a lot of technology on board that boat because Port of Cork is a partner of uh, C5. And uh, so basically everything we learn, well, they can basically benefit from. Tracing Dennis Murphy was an important uh, element because we do pull dredging in, in Cork. We have such a current uh, on our tides that if we plow in, in, in the channel, well, the tide will take care uh, of the rest. Uh, so basically for the engineer of the port to know exactly where the daemon is working, is an important element. Uh, people are telling me, oh no, this is Big Brother. You, you, are, you are tracing us. You are, uh, it's not nice. Uh, I've spent enough time at sea to tell you that there is no such thing as Big Brother at sea. You want people to know where you are. Uh, big Brother, it's big, it's red, it's pictured for you there. It costs a fortune when it has to come and get you out there. It had to come for me once. 20 some years ago in the middle of uh, the Amazon forest and he could not find me. And I almost died because of that. So I think I like my brother, especially when it's big and red like this. So it's very important. During the Ocean to City race, the conversation started with Aiden who was sitting up over there a few, few weeks ago when we were saying, well, it would be nice to have assets where we could tell exactly where uh, rowing boats, which we can't find uh, basically on a radar because they're far too small. If we could get a clear picture, is there any pilots in the room? Any guys doing pilotage or has done pilotage? When you're taking in a, a tanker into Port of Cork, it's, it's like big, driving a big truck and not seeing the bicycle in front. So if you, if you, if you could have a, a web page where all those assets would be listed for you, what you would, it would save you you know, driving over one. So it's, it's an important one. Tom here, uh, who does, uh, was very involved into uh, rowing, actually 
and, Ro and, and Roddy and I, we had that conversation many, many times. So that device basically, which cost 450, 500 euro, well, can be equipped on any skiff uh, and, and basically on a web page, you can see exactly where those assets are. When you run the Ocean to City um, race, uh, a certain amount of uh, skiff are, are, are leaving and you must make sure that you have the same amount on arrival. Some people will retire and they won't let know anyone. So how do you know where they are? Uh, then you, you, send a, you, you send a rescue group, basically. You try to find them because for as far as I know, they could have sunk somewhere. And with those tracers, well, we know where they are. We know they haven't retired. We know their speed, actually. We'll see that in a minute. Security. Ah, another big challenge. And we encrypt all our transfer. So, so basically, all the data that travel between an S360 and um, a coastal station is encrypted. Uh, the chance of breaking into this, when well, you're talking millions of, if not billions of, of, of characters. So basically, because we use a, you know, a good pre-share key with, with a lot of uppercase, a lot of lowercase, a lot of numbers, uh, it makes it longer to hack into. I'm not saying that it's not possible, saying that it's longer. And time is not necessarily what you have at sea. So if you consider those two vessels, uh, basically if we, if the little trawler there in the middle was trying to hack between the two CFI antennas and the two ships, well it would take a certain amount of time to sneak the channel on clients so with wrong authentication so you know what kind of authentication policy is being used. Capture enough handshake so you can isolate the kind of password and try to, to run uh, that against you know, uh, the, the, the communication. At this price, it's probably easier to hack into a satellite because the, the connection is steady. At the same time you, you would do that, you would have to make sure that your trawler is, is staying in range, which of, of, would become very obvious uh, to the bridge of those uh, uh, vessels because they, they will see that they are shadowed and to be shadowed, you know, at 10 kilometers, hello, there must be something there. Um, so to crack uh, such an encryption, well, you need either a lot of IT power on board, plenty of geeks, okay, and computers, and very strong computers. So if it's hard on land, it's even harder at sea. As I said, all the hardware is very, very sealed and checked. So if anyone kind of mess up temper, uh, when you open uh, basically uh, the tracer, when you, we, we get a warning that the tracer has been compromised. So the first thing we'll do is we'll warn the owner of the ship and we'll say, look, the antenna has been compromised. Let us have a look. We can swap them. And remember that if you were to hack at sea, that's what it could look like as well. So not only you would have to shadow, but you would have to shadow in this condition. Yesterday, Enrique and I were setting up a, an antenna on a, on a Benito trawler 42. It was rolling and rolling and rolling. Enrique and I, we had to get out regularly not to get CC. Okay, try to figure out the hacking scenario where you have to walk against the, the corridor there, the wall, you know, really. Uh, if hacking is not easy, it's even more difficult at sea. It's possible. There are some examples, mostly on miners, uh, but hacking for what? Does it worth it, really? So it's easier said than done. The innovation part, uh, Gillian Keating said last year that CFI could be uh, to maritime communication, what iPhone is to the app market. It's amazing the amount of projects that are landing on my desk since we started talking about uh, C5. We worked with the Naval Service on electronic interception of uh, sensor transmission. So flying uh, basically a sensor, a uh, pack of sensor under a UAV and you know defining a clear maritime picture of the sensor transmission. So not necessarily looking at what's floating around, but that was transponding around, if you see what I mean. Another, uh, oops. Another aspect, uh, really, of uh, data communication with UAV 
uh, what we doubt is uh, the, the observation of marine disaster and first response, but also pollution control. Uh, SkyTech and SeaTech have worked together recently uh, on a project for uh, Marpol, basically, and, and trying to define what was leaking from a barrel in the middle, your floating barrel in the middle of a port. Is it gasoline? Is it fuel? I, I had once had to go with my rig, you know, uh, out there finding out what was leaking, and I realized pretty close with a two-stroke horse, uh, 40 horsepower, that was in the middle of gasoline. Imagine my face. Uh, well, you, you, you're very humble in, in this kind of situation. You just another. Oops, I skipped a slide there. Another aspect I've touched on is the observation of a fall-off shot. And again, this is a, a contribution from the Irish Naval Service. Well, let's say a close collaboration uh, between SeaTech, who's a, a strategic partner, and, and, and the Irish Naval Service, uh, providing the opportunity to develop and test. The first test, long distance for, for C5, were aboard Eliola. Uh, we went 27 kilometers uh, south of Rochester Point, and we had a technician in Rochester Point, and we managed to, to carry a Skype conversation all the way 27 kilometers without any satellite, without any, just just a simple radio, wireless uh, video voiceover, and at 27 kilometers, of course, the signal started, you know, uh, being being a bit weak because we're reaching the horizon. Eliola the mass there, the antenna was propped at 15 meters roughly. And Russia's point lighthouse would be 20 meters above the, the water as far as our antenna is concerned. And the communication was possible, was completely private, so not transiting by any satellite, uh, so probably more private than any other co communication we know, such as satellite or 3G, which transit through public networks. An interesting element is at uh, 27 kilometers, we're, we're, although this Skype conference call was not possible anymore, we were still able to, to send emails, send and receive emails very easily. It was a great success. Uh, being able to avail, you know, 40 men of crew and, a, and an asset such as, as Eliola and, and power and all this, I mean, can you imagine the cost for a, for a, a startup? It's just not possible. So that would not be possible if CTEC was not part of the animal cluster. Safety. Ah, well, look at that here. Jerry Sutton and uh, Mike Reeve there, rowing. I told you about uh, the tracer uh, that we equipped, you know, their skiff over the weekend. But I don't know if you can see there at the top, but we can tell their speed as well, uh, direction, and <coughs> the geofencing we can tell when they're past certain places. So we had set up a few geofence during the weekend, and uh, when they passed right on most down, uh, Tom was sitting there, was receiving text message. Did you get them, Tom? And, yeah. uh, so every time the, the boat was passing those fence, text message were fired and emails as well. Uh, but the other interesting thing is you see that map uh, at the top there where we can tell exactly where, where they are. That's what I was saying. For, for Pilot, basically, it would be a great asset. Don't ask me where, what, where I was when I've taken that photo there. I was pretty close from the back. Um, it was during my in Port of Cork. And you don't, when, when you see this and when you're on a skiff, basically, you have no way to, to avoid that. But at the same time, the pilot on, uh, I think it's uh, QE there, has no way to see uh, a skiff, basically, uh, at such close distance. This is it, basically. This is me. So, if I have questions, uh, if you have questions, I'll, be, I'll welcome them. Uh, can be technical or non-technical. If it's technical, I might cut it short. If I if I can't answer it, I'll, I'll follow up. Anyone? Yes. <coughs> what, power, what power are you using in the uh, transmitters on the C5 antenna? 19 dB. Uh, when the kind of uh, frequency would be an interesting question, we're using 2.4. And why 2.4? I like that frequency. Uh, think that 
when you're at sea, it's virgin territory. There is not much uh, broadcasting out there. But when you come close to land, uh, there is a lot of noise. At the same time, 2.4 is a robust uh, radio wave, uh, especially with rain. So it's a slightly bigger wave than Alki. Do you get any interference on 2.4 in the harbor? We do, we do. But again, virgin territory, as long as we are where there is no uh, signal, which is important for us. For example, if you say, if you think in the channel, in fairway, okay, uh, well, not much interference over there because there is nothing. So at the same time, when it plays against us, plays with us and for us, uh, when we are in the area that matter. And what matter more? To be able to transform where you alongside the wall? Naturally, I mean, the, the, the USB or whatever cable is still there. Uh, a direct link, we have that, a Seabird. Seabird operates at 5G. So basically, a ship can be equipped with both. So when you come alongside, you can have a 5G link, which will connect you directly to the office. More questions? Uh, uh, I'm from Mahamara, and uh, interested in what you're saying about the ocean to city race and how this technology might be applied um, and uh, you know I think it's very exciting it's the kind of thing that in theory we certainly <coughs> might embra like to embrace but um, I have a feeling that Moore's law would want to apply to the device for a few generations before it would become really practical. Again the people and changing the people and the cost as well I mean 400 euro well, you're probably talking more 500 than 400, uh, can be seen as an expensive uh, asset to equip uh, a crack or, or a skiff. Well, at the same time, how much do you value the life of the people? That's an easy one to say. But, uh, you know, I mean, the cost of disaster sometimes and a rescue team is far more than that. Now, the other thing is, you're right, the, the people is, again, the... Uh, might take a few generations to, to, to get there. Uh, tomorrow or the day after, uh, I'll be in Castlebar and Galway, and I'll be installing these on trawlers. These uh, are being used by uh, uh, trawlers around the country, uh, thanks to the Marine Institute, who's running that pilot project. I've already installed four, uh, four dredger, uh, so that's uh, sailing boats. Uh, in um, in Drogheda, near Drogheda. Uh, the interesting thing is we can tell uh, where the, uh, the fishermen are working. Well, the, the Marine Institute can do that. Uh, not everybody, it's not public. So their fishing ground are respected. Uh, the FMC actually could benefit from this as well because we can tell with this, uh, uh, what is that boat, who's on board, uh, a lot of information, so that saves inspection being conducted to, to regularly. Another advantage uh, from a fishery perspective uh, is, remember what happened to Honeydew? Well, we could not find uh, that boat for a long, long time. Well, with this, we could find them. So if anything happened, they know, I mean, uh, and professional that sea are quite clear that they, they want to be found no matter what. Especially uh, the three boats we are going to equip uh, tomorrow uh, and the day after are very small vessels. So they have no AIS, uh, no radar, uh, they, they completely escaping uh, the, the clear picture, the American picture. Yes? You mentioned AIS, is this some sort of competitor to AIS that has a fit into that picture? Very good question, thanks. Uh, not at all. This is GM. GMS technology, uh, GSM technology, sorry, uh, or Iridium. We have two models. Uh, the uh, GSM is merely a mobile phone, you know, coupled with a, a GPS uh, broadcasting position every minute, every six minutes, every whatever you want. And the Iridium version has an Iridium chips and sent satellite. What's interesting about it, though, is the fact that uh, the transcription uh, is encrypted and the, the, the transmission, if it cannot happen, 
because you're off GSM coverage, well, the device will record that position, and as, so, as soon as it finds a patch of GSM coverage, it will send all this. The server is in the UK, in the data center, uh, and it displays, as, as you've seen, as you've seen on, on the slide there, on the, on the Google chart, API, yeah, but it's private. So uh, if you have a, your own vessel equipped with this, well, the public doesn't trace you, only your, your friends, relatives, or whoever you want. Us, if you decide so. Most of the fishermen uh, we are equipping have said, yet. Yeah, if you could keep an eye, that would be nice. There is a panic button as well, so we can have you know, emergency panic. So is that text message texting on the position? Yeah. It is texting the, the GPS fix, so basically the coordinates, the speed, and the course. To the UK. To the, to, to the server, which happened to be in the UK, it could be anywhere in the world, to be honest, in any data center. More questions? Yeah, yeah. So what you have is the technology that can provide a solution where there's a policy gap in so far as there's not a policy requirement driving small boat yeah. users to, to apply this technology. Can you see any potential for progress being made on the policy dimension? Absolutely. Uh, it's, uh, I think, 90 minutes conversation with Minister for Marine last summer, actually, in his office. And uh, basically, we, we were looking at uh, that clear maritime picture and then the policy and, and how it could roll out. And the experiment run by the uh, Marine Institute is quite interesting because the first 18 units have been purchased uh, and are being rigged free of charge. But as soon as the policy will kick in, well, fishermen will have to pay for their own units. So when this message went out, uh, well, I can tell you that a lot of People were interested in getting their, their vessel equipped uh, with a tracer. Uh, the big fear, I think, what's, what's slowing down uh, this policy is the fact that people think that they're going to be monitored, they're going to be looked on to, you know, kind of uh, become a little bit of a big brother effect. And, uh, but at the same time, if you see it from a, a naval service perspective, if we know exactly, uh, I used to do boarding party uh, in another life inspection. If we know what vessel is out there, well, there is less of a chance to make a move if we've inspected that boat, you know, and if we inspect that boat quite regularly, uh, why would you move uh, an asset such as an OPD, for example, or a coastal uh, patrol vessel uh, at the cost of, you know, great expense to go inspecting a vessel you know you've inspected. So there, there are advantages. I've talked about the search and rescue, but, but the advantages are multiple. So that was discussed as well during that very long conversation. And I think it should be said and said more. But it's, it's pretty incentive. <coughs> more questions? Very silent room. Yeah, okay. So the great opportunity here is that you've got potential applications across a whole range of diverse markets. That's also a big challenge at the early stage because it could be spread too thin. Yeah. So my question is, where do you see the greatest market opportunity and how, how would you get to focus on, on, on that? Uh, that? Absolutely, and it's a, it's, a, it's a very good question. Uh, for as much as I am an engineer and I love technology, I'm also a business owner. And uh, there is the crude reality of, of money and paying people. Uh, and there is what Jim uh, asked me or, or said, you know, about the uh, the iPhone and the apps market, uh, and the and the opportunity I'm getting every day. Oh, we could use it for this, and we could. And then you have to do a slight modification to your technology. And that's what you, you you call spreading yourself to thin. I think the answer is on two elements: uh, the wireless connectivity, for example, uh, a recent. Uh, customer interested, Tarbert Ferries, uh, Shannon Ferries uh, are operating a payment uh, online basically and they need their ferries to be connected. Uh, for them this is a very important uh, element. So basically that, you know, that's an opportunity for us because it's a direct application of the technology we have and the technology developed with uh, the Irish Naval Service. 
and you can monitor follow up shots well you can invert that and you can also process payment online so you keep your two ferries connected to an office onshore and basically payments are being made in real time direct application and you take a product you develop it and with the navy you put it to market within six months and the tracing device uh, which are ready, work, and are efficient. So that's the two main elements. Now, there is another uh, element, which is the professional services, which consists of installing all this. And I'm, I'm still getting a lot of work as well uh, on that front, hopefully, which is quite nice. Uh, project management, mainly. Yes? Um, you mentioned, I think, at the beginning about exporting some of this technology. For that, how would you go about that? Would you do it as your own company, or is it a matter of leveraging through much bigger organizations who have the markets out there already? Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to take any risks. I'm going to say a bit of both, but I'm going to <laughs> let myself be challenged on that. Uh, we have appointed uh, uh, a selling agent in, in, in France. We're looking for one in the UK. Uh, it's a question of approaching ports mainly uh, and telling them what we got. We, yeah. When visiting Dover, for example, uh, in November, they were quite excited with the fact that we can go at 27 kilometers because 27 kilometers from Dover, well, you have Calais. Uh, so that's very interesting to them, especially if you consider that none of the ferries have satellite communication for the passengers. It's for them, they're very sat on for different purposes. And the fact that port can resell as well, it's all designed, all packaged, so we install it for the port, the port can resell that connectivity to, to other vessels, namely uh, what I call resident vessels. So, um, but yes, it's port ready because 4,475 <coughs> commercial port around the world, that's definitely a market. Uh, because we, what we sell is uh, basically a managed service. So if your port doesn't have any IT department, we're ready to be this way. So we can do that as well. So it's really uh, a solution well packaged that we can deploy pretty much anywhere. Uh, so the export part will probably happen through a, a network of reselling partners. But C5 will quickly evolve into a, a small multinational of 30 people. Uh, you know, working around you. One, one of the biggest difficulties is to be able to hire people and retain that staff and train that staff. It's, uh, and that's what I hope will come in the next couple of years. Uh, we are involved uh, into a lot of projects around uh, CIL, uh, involved as a as, um, um, technical advisor for the uh, Digital Diamond project, which is uh, very similar. Uh, project to, to C5 here in Cork. In fact, C5 is only the technology digital diamond that would be more uh, e-navigation, so it's a broader uh, project which could benefit from uh, C5 technology as, as hardware, basically, as a hardware solution. So basically, there is another way of uh, exporting this, which is just providing the, the infrastructure. And then you can carry whatever data you want in there. Okay. Thank you.